All right, so appreciate it. Stanley Culpepper, University of Georgia. Uh, I'm going to give you an update, and I'm obviously going to focus on weed control. I'm a weed scientist at the University of Georgia. I focus in uh, cotton, grains, and I do a lot of work in vegetables. Um, today, I'm going to focus really on two hot topics in weed control. Um, there's always a lot going on in weed management, especially in the southeast with all the challenges that we have. But I'm going to focus most of my time on the relationship of cover cropping and herbicide resistance. Uh, but I'm going to take just a couple of minutes before I get into herbicide resistance and I want to talk about the hottest topic if you're a grower in the southeast right now, what is going to happen to our formulations of Extendamax, Ingenia, and Fexapan? And of course, they are the ones that are labeled for use on our uh, Dicamba technology. Now, many of you might say, well, what in the world does the registration of these herbicides have to do with conservation tillage? So if you're a cotton grower, we really only have three over-the-top herbicides that I would call that are still effective, that will control our most problematic pests, and that would be Palmer Amaranth. So we have Liberty. You have 2,4-D on, only on tolerant cotton. And then prior to the Ninth Circuit Court vacating the dicamba registrations, we had the dicamba formulations. So if we are not successful in getting these products back, really we have Liberty on most of our acres, which means we would lose that tool very quickly to resistance. And I'll remind you back 2010, 2012, you know what happened to conservation tillage when we lost the ability to use Roundup and did not have other effective tools. So it's very important for every grower, including our conservation tillage growers, uh, to understand what's going on with these dicamba formulations because every single one of us will be impacted by the decisions that are gonna be made uh, very shortly. Now, if you're not familiar with what's going on with those formulations of dicamba and the challenges, the reason we're having those challenges, it's really about off-target movement. And there are two ways, mostly, that are challenging us with off-target movement. One is particle drift. Particle drift is the droplet that comes out of your sprayer, my sprayer, uh, where it goes. That's a challenge we have every time we're on the sprayer, we need to make sure it stays on the target. But the one that is challenging the EPA the most with the dicamba formulations is actually volatility. All right, volatility, the way I look at it, to simplify it, you, and I, you or I go out and make a perfect application. We put these formulations like Extendamax exactly where we want it to go. And over the next 72 hours, it lifts from the treated area and moves off target and causes damage. Now the positive and what I wanted to share today and what I'm showing you in these pictures is we are making monumental progress in addressing this issue. Um, these are the results. If you look on the left, this is 2020, what was labeled, what you would have done uh, this past year with Roundup Plus Extendamax in some of our tunnel study volatility work. Well, what we've learned already this year that we could implement in 2021, you can see a tremendous amount of difference in the level of dicamba damage on those soybeans. If you're not familiar with dicamba damage on those soybeans, it's the cupping. So my point is we are making monumental progress very rapidly in mitigating, not eliminating, but mitigating the amount of this product that lifts uh, on its own after we've left the field. And this could be very, very valuable and in, in the decision making by the US EPA. If you're curious when the decision is going to come, there are some officials at the US EPA that have advised us they hope to make a decision sometime in October to allow farmers time to choose which seed technologies they want to use. With that said, October is not far away, but I would expect October 31st would be the soonest we would hear. So again, that, that is very important to think about. We need every tool we can have uh, that's available for our growers, uh, regardless of whether you're cotton, your soybean, your corn, or you're a produce grower, right? Now, I want to switch gears with you, and I'm going to focus the rest of my time really about conservation tillage and its influence on herbicide resistance, or more exclusively today, I'm going to talk about reducing selection pressure. And the reason we want to reduce selection pressure is we reduce the potential of herbicide resistance. And the first thing I wanted to share with you, this is a really neat survey we conducted uh, two years ago. We actually asked 
our growers, what are the most problematic pests in the state of Georgia? So a couple things are interesting. I'm not talking about a specific crop. I'm not talking about whether it's a weed, a disease, an insect. I just generally said, what's your most challenging pest? And the coolest part of this survey was you didn't have multiple choice. You actually had to go in and write in your response. We actually had 1,737 growers that took the time to write in a response to our survey, which was pretty amazing. Now, the results were somewhat interesting. There was no doubt Palmer amaranth is the most problematic pest in, in Georgia and probably the Southeast without a, a doubt across agronomic crops. But the distance between number one and number two, and I'll point out 1,773 times Palmer amaranth was listed by 1,737 growers. So that means some growers are putting Palmer amaranth as their number one, number two, and number three most, most po problematic pests. The second most problematic pest we have was morning glory. And I'm gonna tie in the Palmer amaranth and the morning glory as I go through what I'm gonna share with you in a little bit. But I just wanted to give you an idea of what our growers, a large volume of the growers in our state, which also farm states uh, adjacent to us. And the reason, or one of the reasons, is of course resistance. We are, we are rapidly losing our herbicides, the effectiveness of those herbicides in controlling Palmer amaranth, again, quite rapidly. Obviously, pretty much everyone has resistance to Roundup, Many of our growers across the Southeast have resistance to what we call our ALS chemistry, our staple or cadre type herbicides. We have some hot spots where we have resistance to atrazine. We have corn growers that, that are no longer effectively controlling pigweed with atrazine. And then we have spread out across our region some hot spots where we have resistance to our yellow herbicides, basically our prowls, our treflans, our solans. And now at least this year in Georgia, we have confirmed we have resistance to the PPO chemistry. Now I couldn't list all the PPO chemistry on the slide, so I had to make an additional slide. These are a lot of important herbicides. These are no longer effectively controlling emerged pigweed in those fields where we have resistance. And if we overuse these chemistry, just like we overuse Roundup, we will have continuing loss of effectiveness of these tools. I'll give you just one picture as an indication of what we're looking at in these locations where we have resistance. This is reflux at 96 ounces per acre. Generally in cotton, we, we don't use that much reflux, but let's say you're a soybean guy and you're spraying post-emergence, 24 ounces would be the maximum use rate. This is two inch Palmer amaranth and it's growing in a greenhouse, which means it's really, really sensitive. So we simply can't kill this pigweed in the greenhouse. So there's no way our farmer is going to manage this with products like Reflex, Cobra, or Blazer. So the point of this is we are losing our chemistry at an alarming rate. All right, so the number one challenge we have in weed management, it may not be the number one challenge on every farm, but it's a, it's a number one concern that you need to be thinking about on every farm is protecting the herbicide chemistry that is currently working for you. All right, so just a little history, last herbicide mode of action. Now, not the last new product name, right? They're all, there's always new product names, whether it's a, a mixture of different herbicides or it's an old herbicide with a new cool name. But as far as the last new way of killing a weed, 1984. Now, some may argue it was 1985, but the EPA says 84, so we're gonna go with the EPA. Our next new chemistry, you know, we see some things in the farm press about some new chemistry coming. I'll be surprised if it's in our fields in the Southeast before I retire. All right, so we're losing our chemistry. We're not gaining chemistry uh, and we're guaranteed to have more resistance unless we make highly intelligent decisions every single day on our family farms. And that's really what I wanna take a few minutes to talk about. So. When we think about protecting our chemistry, we want to protect it all. But if we have to prioritize it, the number one thing we have to do is we have to protect our post-emergence herbicides. The reason for that is we're going to lose them more quickly. And also we have less of them, right? So again, I'm a cotton guy, so I'll mention we don't have dicamba today. Hopefully we'll have it in 2021. You would have 2,4-D, you would have Liberty. 
of course, you still have products like Staple and these other products you can apply over the top, but resistance is such a significant issue on so many acres, their utility has become quite limited. So when we think about those three chemistries and we think about how are we gonna protect them? And let me add in, uh, I'm assuming you've seen a lot of the information out of the Mid-South where they think they already have resistance or tolerance of pigweed in dicamba. So those of us in the Southeast have to make sure this does not happen to us uh, because we know it will if you make bad decisions. All right, so what are we gonna do? Well, the first thing we have to do is we always have to run a sound diversified herbicide program. Uh, and we have to be smart about the diversity using different modes of action in that herbicide system. But that's clearly not enough. We're gonna have to include either a tillage component in that management program or a cover crop component in that program. Obviously here today, we're gonna to talk about cover crops, all right? Of course, tillage is an effective approach, but so is cover crops. So I'm gonna share with you some of the results of the research we've done currently, and I'm gonna show you some things that we can do using cover crops to help mitigate the development of resistance. Now I'm talking mostly about resistance. You may want to talk about, I want better control. Well, right now, resistance management and keeping the chemistry working for you equals better control and it keep, equals you staying on your family farm. So again, I won't focus a lot today about increasing weed control. I want to talk about protecting the chemistry. All right, and there's one easy, easy way to think about this. When you think about protecting your chemistry, what you want to do is you want to kill the fewest number of plants with us, Palmer Amaranth, with your favorite tool. All right, so we want to do everything we can to have the lowest number of Palmer Amaranth in our crop to kill with our post-emergence herbicide. All right, it's truly that simple. All right, now you got to have some luck to go with it, but we can't control luck, but we can influence the number of pigweed that are there to kill with our post-emergence tool. And I'm going to share with you conservation tillage and pre-emergence herbicides, what they can do to protect your post-emergence herbicides. All right, I'm not gonna share a lot of data with you. Looks like the slides moved a little bit, but it's not gonna be, be a big deal. What we're looking at is this is the number of Palmer amaranth that we killed with post-emergence herbicides during the entire season, three locations in Georgia, one location in Tennessee. So the ball on your left, there are 872,000 Palmer Amaranth per acre where we conventionally tilled, no cover, no herbicides. This would actually be pretty average for many of our growers, believe it or not. We were not trying to represent a research-based system. It was more of a grower type production system. Where we added a rolled rye cover crop, and let me stress, you can't see it on the slide, but we strategically did not go out and try to be that top 5% cover crop biomass producer with 10,000 pounds of dry biomass. We were a moderate four to 5,000 pounds. Very easy to accomplish with rye. You can even get that close with some really good weed or oat or triticale type crop. So again, it's important to point out, we were trying to be average with the amount of biomass we were producing. But what you see for the entire year, entire year, we reduced the number of pigweed that we had to kill by 65%. So every one of those pigweeds that did not come up because of that rye cover crop, we didn't have to kill it with a post-emergence herbicide. And that reduces the pressure or the potential for developing resistance on the chemistry that's important to you. Whether it's Liberty, whether it's Atrazine, whether it's Dicamba, whether it's 2,4-D, it's all the same. And I'll also point out at the bottom of the slide, if you can see it, the number of uh, pigweed, it, the cover crop reduced at the time of our early post application was 75% less pigweed. Post two, 70%. And by the time we got to the end of the year with the final application was 54%. So with this rye cover crop, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, we saw benefits from start to finish on Palmer Amaranth. Now here's where I need to take a little footnote and say all weeds do not respond the same. We are fortunate Palmer Amaranth is probably one of the most sensitive weeds there is to a cover cropping system because it needs light to emerge and it's a very, very weak seedling. But for example, our number two most problematic pest in the state, Morning Glory, 
is very resilient, very tolerant to a cover crop, and we usually do not see an influence of morning glory with a cover crop, maybe a week or two delay in emergence, but it does not have the same influence. So again, it is species dependent. We're just fortunate that our baddest boy uh, is very, very vulnerable to a cover crop. Now, the amount of biomass, because I'm sure there's some elite conservation tillage farmers on, on the training here today, there is no question the more biomass you have, the more that you block the sun from getting to the ground, the less palmer amaranth that you will have that's going to emerge. There's no question about it. Uh, you can correlate that pretty much anytime you, you want to do that. Now this slide, again, the data moved just a little bit. The left bar is the same number where there's no cover crop, 870 some thousand palmer amaranth per acre. The middle bar is where we had the rye cover crop, where we reduced uh, Palmer amaranth emergence for the season 65%. The far right bar is actually my pre-emergence herbicide. So what we actually saw in these four locations, two different states in two years, is we saw that pre-emergence herbicide had to be activated now. You dry land guys, we got to get it activated. But we saw a 97.8% reduction in the number of pigweed we had to kill with a post-emergence herbicide for the entire season by putting a good pre-emergence tool out. And we put that tool out at rates that would not hurt our crop. All right, so now a couple of things to think about. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So why in the world would you not use a pre-emergence herbicide? I have no idea. That, that is absolutely a requirement for continued farming. But number two, think about the cover crop now. We talked about the cover crop reduced the number of pigweed the post-emergence herbicide had to kill. It also reduced the number of weeds the pre-emergence herbicide had to kill. So that cover crop is protecting my reflex, it's protecting my diuron, and it's protecting whatever your favorite post-emergence tool is. So if you look at the most sustainable and most effective program, it's going to be the rye cover crop with a pre-emergence herbicide coupled with a sound post-emergence and, and lay-by directed system. Now, I always get this question, usually from our elite conservation tillage guys that can grow unbelievable amounts of biomass that I can't even accomplish. Do I really need a pre-emergence herbicide? This is a study where we had eight to 10,000 pounds of dry biomass that we rolled. On your left, I put Roundup out to kill the cover crop. On your right, I put Roundup plus Valor out. To me, it's really, really simple. If you're even close to an average grower in an average field, you have a half a million to a million Palmer amaranth per acre. You will benefit monumentally from the use of a residual herbicide. Now, if you're the elite person that's been doing this for 25 years and you haven't seen a Palmer amaranth in 10 years, you're an exception. But in general, if you choose the right chemistry with your cover crop, it will get to the soil that's showing where the sun will get there and you will see a monumental benefit. So almost always, not always, but almost always a good at plant residual herbicide will benefit you and pay off if you can get it activated. All right, so I'm going to switch gears and talk just a minute um, about what's the ideal cover crop in regards to weed control. And really, it's up to you. Every one of us is different. Every one of us likes different things, all right? Weed control probably isn't the number one management decision on your farm. It's not on mine. It's at the top, but it's not number one. But if you think about weed control and you think about the greatest benefits for weed control using a cover crop, you have to think the biomass volume, the more biomass you have, the better weed control you're going to have on those species that are sensitive, especially palmer amaranth. And then you have to think about stability. You know, I showed you how cover crops were reducing the number of pigweed we had to kill from start to finish. If you choose a cover crop that gives out three or four weeks after you plant, then you won't see that continual benefit through the season uh, like I shared with you earlier. So really it's about the volume of the cover crop and the stability, right? Do I want 10,000 pounds of, of dry rye biomass? Oh, it's great for weed control, but if you can't get a stand, 
it's of no benefit whatsoever. So you have to decide what is best for your operation. So when we're choosing, again, it's about the stability and the, and the volume. Uh, we've done a lot of research now over the last 15 or 18 years. In some situations in the past, some cover crops we didn't want to grow because of controlling them, right? Not what it did in the crop, but could we kill it at, at the time we wanted to plant the cash crop? Well, for the most part, we have overcome those issues. You may have some oddball we'd have to work on, but for the most part, we can overcome it quite easily. Your grain crops, I'm a fan of the grains. They're really easy to establish. They're really easy to grow. They're really easy to control for the most part. I will mention black oats, especially sometimes when we try to kill it with Roundup, it can be a challenge. You can't use a reduced rate and you need to understand stage of growth and especially nighttime temperatures and rate tank mixtures could influence um, that control. Just to, to very, very briefly, if we catch, say, wheat, for example, joining through boot, uh, it's often a little bit more difficult to control, all right? But in general, we can manage those without a huge deal. What about your cover crop, uh, clover? In the past, a lot of people would even want to deal with clover because they couldn't control it. Uh, we have really overcome that. Again, my data slid around. Just look at the bar. Roundup's not that good on controlling clover, but we can take Roundup plus Dicamba do really good. And we also learned over the last couple of years, Liberty is a wonderful tool. So if you like Clover, but you're concerned about killing it, we have overcome uh, those challenges for us. The biggest challenge I've had with Clover three out of the last five years, I've actually seen a reduction in the stand of cotton when I plant into a Clover cover crop versus a conventional or a rye Clover crop. You can see what I'm showing here is the gaps greater than one foot, uh, one foot down at the Sunbelt Expo. Uh, and this is an example where we had 88 gaps uh, in our clover. And that doesn't mean yield loss, right? Doesn't mean yield loss in cotton, but it is at least a concern to me. And we had an additional study where in our sixth year of planting into the same cover crops, and the last three years I've seen a reduced stand against with, again, when I go into clover. All right, I have to stress out, I do use the standard seed treatment, but I do not put it in furrow fungicide, which might help overcome that challenge. But I will throw out cotton and clover, you need to study it closely if it's cool and wet the first two weeks after you plant. As far as, uh, here's just a picture that shows you, uh, if you look at the rye and the conventional, this is what we're seeing, good growth, uh, everything is good to go. And then our clover, we see a, a smaller plant and a reduced stand. Again, highly correlated if it's cool and wet. And again, just in cotton, uh, even though we are running a strip till unit. All right, a couple of last words and then I'm gonna get out of the way, try to get y'all back a little bit. Uh, I'm not a huge vetch fan at all. Some of the previous speakers have said that as well. If you need to control it, we can help you control it with either Roundup Dicamba or 2,4-D or if it's mature, we can go with on Diron. But if you do vetch and it gets mature and you wanna grow something like wheat, the following fall, oh my gosh, it's gonna be a nightmare for us. So uh, just think that one through for sure. Last one I wanna mention, this is the, the most interesting and challenging for me as a weed scientist. So ryegrass, uh, if you've ever grown it for a cover, you know it's a great cover crop, especially in the, in the cattle type rotation. But what you have to understand is ryegrass is genetically prone to develop resistance to herbicides more quickly than any other plant on earth, including Palmer amaranth. Basically, there's resistance to ryegrass to every class of chemistry that's out there. So if you are wanting to use ryegrass as a cover crop for a cash crop and you're having to control it with the herbicide, probably Roundup, you're likely going to develop resistance to Roundup in three to five years. Keep in mind there's Roundup resistant ryegrass in, in the Mid-South already. And I would encourage you to think about how are you going to manage ryegrass if it gets resistant to Roundup? I don't know that you can economically do it without going back to tillage. So you need to walk carefully with that. Roundup is a better option than Gramoxone. The best plan, they call it the double knock in Australia, is to go out and apply Roundup five to seven days later, come back with Gramoxone. Don't give any chance for any plant to survive that Roundup application. So just, 
I never have ryegrass as a potential cover crop in my systems because of this. I cannot afford to have ryegrass with resistance to Roundup. It could be absolutely devastating economically for a farming operation. So just be cautious and be careful.